Amen. So you're there in Luke chapter number five. So we're starting a series tonight called Jesus the, and we're looking at different roles of Jesus, different analogies um, that Jesus um, gave to himself, especially. And in Luke chapter number five, we see a very interesting um, title that Jesus gives himself or a job, I guess, that you could say Jesus gives himself. And Luke chapter 5 is very interesting, even though this story um, also is in other places in the gospel, in Mark and also uh, Matthew. But um, Jesus here calls himself, in verse number 31, he calls himself a physician. All right, he calls himself a physician. But what's interesting about this, so that's the title of the sermon tonight, is Jesus the physician, or Jesus the great physician. Really, and what's interesting about Luke chapter number five, before we even get into the story, is here we see Jesus literally healing people of physical ailments. We see he heals a man of leprosy. This is at the beginning of his ministry. And then later on we see they lower the man who is sick of the palsy into, um, into the midst of all the, the big crowd of people in the house. They take the roof off and they lower him down and he heals that man. But then what you see is a transition from the physical into the spiritual when he calls himself the physician. Because what's interesting, if you look down at verse number 27, so we're looking at Jesus, the great physician tonight, all right? So we saw Jesus literally heal um, two people in just this chapter, but now Jesus is transferring this idea of him healing um, physical people to a spiritual sense. And of course, as I mentioned this morning, nobody gets it. All right, look down at verse number 27, where the Bible says, And after these things he went forth and saw a publican named Levi sitting at the receipt of custom, and he said unto him, Follow me. So the publicans are like, you know, the IRS agents, right? They're, they're uh, known to be, um, they're known to be thieves, and they're known to be dishonest. They're the tax collectors of the time. It was pretty much assumed that these tax collectors would be dishonest people and they were doing a, um, something that was not um, considered just, all right? Uh, so this publican, this tax collector named Levi, was sitting at the receipt of custom and he said unto him, follow me. And he left all, rose up and followed him and Levi made him a great feast. So Levi follows Jesus and then he makes this great feast in his own house. And there was a great company of publicans. So he invites all his tax collector friends um, to meet Jesus and of others that sat down with them. But their scribes and Pharisees, these are the religious leaders, murmured against the disciples saying, why do ye eat and drink with publicans and sinners? And Jesus answered them said, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. So what's interesting is what Jesus does there is really brilliant as far as this chapter goes, because there was nothing physically wrong with all these publicans that he was having dinner with. There was, um, you know, he had just physically healed somebody who was lame, and then he physically healed somebody of leprosy. But now he says, they that are sick need not a physician, but he's talking, or they that are whole need not a physician, um, but they that are sick, referencing the publicans that he's having dinner with where there's nothing physically wrong with them. But that's what he's been doing is physically healing people. And so he's transitioning this to a spiritual sense. And of course, it goes right over everybody's head. But look, Jesus is just creating the Bible for us here. He's just writing these words down so we can understand this doctrine. You think about how great this is, that even though people didn't at that time really understand what he was saying, that he's literally creating the doctrine of the Christian faith right in front of us here, which is uh, just a, gr a, a great um, thing. I mean, which is a, a, just a lesson for us, by the way, uh, just in life. Just because people don't understand the truth that you're telling them doesn't mean you shouldn't say it. And just remember that. So just remember, if somebody is saying something or asking you something, whether that be at the door or just in your life every day, and you tell them the truth, meaning the Word of God, you tell them that, and they don't fully understand it. Obviously, we can help them understand it, but even if it goes over their head, we don't need to dumb things down for people, all right? We just need to speak the truth, no matter the audience, and you know what? Maybe you'll spark a thought in somebody, even in, in somebody that's not really interested in hearing the whole truth. You just speak the truth and, you know, let it speak for itself, literally, all right? So that's what Jesus was doing here. He's just creating 
the Bible right in front of us. All right, but look at what he says in verse number 32. So we know that he's talking about not physically healing these publicans, but he's talking about them being sick uh, in a spiritual sense. And look at verse number 32. He finishes up here and he says, I came not to call, he explains it, I came not to call the righteous, righteous, but sinners to repentance. So they literally said, why are you hanging out with all these sinners? And he said, I came to call the sinners to repentance, meaning he's explaining that's what he means by the sickness that they have. The sickness that they have is their sin, all right? And he says, I'm coming to call them to repentance. So th that begs the question, what's he talking about? What is repentance? Turn to Psalm chapter number 90. I just got into this um, out soul winning. Um, somebody was just asking me question after question after question about re repentance. And I just, just this last Thursday, and it is really interesting how this word has just been redefined to mean turning from your sins or the, the, the common phrase, repenting of your sins. All right. So Jesus is definitely saying that he's calling sinners to something. We just need to figure out what he's talking about. Look at Psalm chapter number 90 and look at verse number 13. The first thing we can look at in the Bible is all the cases of God repenting all the cases where God repents. In verse number 13 of Psalm 90, the Bible says, well, what are we doing here? We're looking at what Jesus was talking about that sinners need to be called to, all right? They need to be called to repentance. Look at Psalm 90, verse 13. The Bible says, Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. So here we see people asking God to repent. We're asking God to repent. Turn to Jeremiah chapter number 18. And look at verse number 10. So what would God need to repent from? And I'm going to show you that in the Bible, God can repent from both good and God can repent from evil, meaning harm or hurt or judgment that he's pouring out um, on somebody. Look at Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse number 10. So up in verse number 5 of Jeremiah 18, you'll see that it's the Lord speaking, just so we get uh, a clear idea of who is doing the talking here, whose words this is. In verse number 10, Jeremiah 18 says, If it do evil in my sight, that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good. See, God is he's, he's repenting of the good, wherewith I said I would benefit them. So repenting sounds like it's a change of direction, or what we're going to see here is a change of mind. Look at Jonah chapter 3 and verse number 10, a very famous verse. If you're a soul winner, you need to know this verse and how to explain it. But in Jonah chapter 3 and verse number 10, we see God repenting from evil. So God repented from good in Jeremiah 18, and he's going to repent from evil in verse number 10 of Jonah chapter 3, where the Bible says, And God saw their works, this is the people of Nineveh, that they turned from their evil way, and God repented of the evil that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. So that's the quintessential verse that we use to explain away this false doctrine of needing to repent of your sins to be saved, all right? Showing that we know the Bible is very clear that being saved is not of works, all right? Ephesians 2, 8 through 9, it is not of works. Here, turning from your sins is literally a work. It explains that in Jonah chapter 3 in verse number 10. And then we see that repent, that word, it cannot mean repent of your sins. It's not like repent and repent of your sins are the same thing. It, it just doesn't uh, make any sense because God did all this repenting that I've been reading to you in these verses so far. So God repented, meaning what? God saw that they, as a city, they got right. As a nation, you can get right and God can change his mind about when he's going to break judgment. This is a, a good lesson for us in our nation today. We can get right and God can delay his judgment upon our nation. God delayed his judgment on Nineveh in Jonah 3.10. And he said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. God changed his mind. And people will be like, well, God can change his mind? Of course God can change his mind. God changes his mind all the time. That's what I've been reading for you here. You say, well, did God get it wrong? No. God changes his mind is proof that he truly gave us free will. We truly have free will to obey or turn against God with every decision that we make. And God, according to our free will, 
This is Calvinism destroying right here. According to our free will, can decide whether or not to change his judgment or reaction towards whether we are drawing closer to him, drawing nigh unto him, or turning our backs on him. From every decision that we make personally to every decision that a nation or the leaders of a nation uh, makes together. Not talking about salvation in jo Jonah 3.10. Just talking about a nation or a city getting right with God. All right? They, they turned. They, God saw their works. They turned from their evil way. That is repenting of their sins. They turned from their sins in that case. Not to be saved, but to be physically saved from the judgment of God in that case. All right, so look, repentance, all that to say this, we're looking at what Jesus was saying is that I call, I came to call sinners to repentance. But see, people like, they see sin and repent in the same like verse and they're just like, oh, repent of your sins. Like, no, don't change the word of God. Don't flip the word of God around. Don't create your own. It's not like Mad Libs where you can just take a, a verse and just create your own sentence. Okay, so repentance cannot mean, the word cannot mean repent from sin. It cannot mean that. Why? Because God repented, and we know that in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that Jesus knew no sin. We know that in Hebrews chapter 5, that Jesus was tempted as we are. Hebrews chapter 4, he, Jesus was tempted as we are, yet without sin. God is the only one that is good. We looked at this morning. God does not sin. God does not have sin. It would make no sense that God would have sin to turn from or repent from. All right? So let's not add, you know, definitions. What does it mean so far that we've seen that God is doing? He's simply changing his mind. All right? Now, now that we have this definition, let's test it out in the New Testament and see if it matches everywhere we see repentance in the New Testament. Because guess what? You cannot be saved without repentance. Repentance is necessary for salvation. So don't just get allergic to the word repentance. We just need to explain to people at the door that have been brainwashed into this new definition of repentance. You literally look up repentance in the dictionary. You look up repent in the dictionary and it says, repent of your sins. What? That's how deep this false doctrine goes. So we have to define it using the Bible itself, right? Look at Acts chapter 3 and verse number 19. So repentance, folks, it does not mean turn from your sin. It can't because God does not have sin to turn from. So what was Jesus talking about? It appears that it means to change your mind because that's what we saw people asking God to do. That's what we saw God doing in the couple verses that we looked at. Look at Acts chapter 3. Let's test this out. Look at verse number 19. Repent ye therefore, and be converted. So that's a really great verse right there to look at as far as um, what repentance actually means because the very next phrase kind of defines what he's talking about. He says, repent ye therefore, ye meaning a plural group of people, and be converted. So repenting means what? That they're converting. Repenting means that they are converting to what? The, the Christian faith, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, all right? That your sins may be blotted out, all right? It doesn't say that you turned from your sins. Because, look, if you could turn from all your sins, do they even need to be blotted out? I mean, if you could just suddenly become sinless, that's another thing that's, that's just crazy about this doctrine that just makes no sense at all, is people that believe this doctrine, including the person that I talked to on Thursday, they will never tell you that they can turn from all their sins. Right. It, it makes no sense. So, like, so you're saying that you have to turn from your sins to be saved. Yes. Well, what if you don't turn from all your sins? Well, see, it's just like this morning. It's just the sins that they've turned from. The bar is exactly where they set it. So you're saying you can turn from all your sins and just stop sinning? Well, no. Well, where's the list then? Where's the list? Where's the list? Where's the chart? Where's the timelines? Where is this information? It's not there. Because repenting of your sins is not necessary for salvation. All right? Now let's just look at the, the definition that we came up with, the change of mind. Change your mind, ye therefore, and be converted. Perfect. It matches perfectly. Go to Luke chapter 13. Let's try it again. Luke chapter 13, 
Look at verse number 3. Just because repent and sin are in the same sentence does not mean you can just jumble up all the words and create your own meanings. That, by the way, if you think them through, they don't make any sense, even to the, even to the people that, that believe them. Look at Luke 13, 3. It says, I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So talking to a bunch of saved people, or unsaved people, a bunch of unbelievers, would it make sense if you talk to a bunch of unsaved people and you just preach the gospel to them, the gospel of Jesus Christ that we preach, and then you went to them, like, look, unless you change your mind, you're going to perish. Would that make sense? Right. Of course it would make sense. Because exactly, that's exactly what it means. Look at Acts chapter 17 and verse number 30. Acts chapter 17, look at verse number 30. Acts chapter 17, look at verse number 30. The Bible says this, it says, And the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. To what? Change their mind. Go to Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38. Acts 2.38. Now, if you remember, in Acts chapter 2.38, and you just put a little reference to Acts chapter 2.38, because, look, people will bring up Acts chapter 2 and verse number 38 to you, on a regular basis, all right? Acts chapter 2, 38, make a little reference to Acts chapter 3, verse number 19. Because here, Peter is saying, Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. See, you have to be baptized to be saved. But what is he saying? He is simply saying, convert and be baptized. He's saying, become a Christian. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Look, Acts 16, 31 would not be true. I mean, it says believe. I literally read Acts 16.31 to someone just recently, the, this person, and I said, you know, look, Acts 16.31, like this simple question is asked, what must I do to be saved? And this is how complicated the Bible is. And the answer is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's how complicated the Bible is. And the person said to me, see, you have to repent of your sins. And I'm just like, I don't know. We're done here, you know? And, you know, it's just, but that's how deep this, and, and look, that is, not, that is not the 50th time that that's happened to me. That's happened to me dozens of times, where you have people just so brainwashed into this repent of your sins, you literally read them a Bible verse that says, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you go, see, repent of your sins. I'm just like, I don't know. I don't know. But see, it's talking about changing your mind. It's talking about being converted. And what's the first thing you should do after you're converted? You should be baptized. All right? But look, the Bible is saying here repentance is definitely necessary for salvation because, and this is very clear, this is very important that we need to, to always remember this. All right? We always need to remember this when we go out soul winning. People must change their mind. People must completely let go of what they believed before, you cannot, turn to Romans chapter 11, I'll prove it to you, you cannot just add Jesus. You cannot just believe all the other things, reincarnation, all these other things. You must, I was given the gospel a couple weeks ago, I think it was during the soul winning marathon, and I was given the gospel, and I was about three quarters of the way through the gospel, and it seemed like it was going pretty well, and then the gal brought up, well, yeah, I, I, I don't know how we ended up talking about reincarnation. She mentioned something, and I'd be like, yeah, that's, that's Buddhist or Hindu, and, you know, they talk about reincarnation. She's like, I kind of believe that. And at that point, I knew that this lady, although she was going to listen to the gospel and it would be a seed planted, that she was not going to get saved. Why? Because she needs to let go of that. Right. It's not just agreeing with what I say here. It's letting go of all that stuff. It's not adding Jesus. We're not adding Jesus. Look at verse number uh, 6 of Romans chapter 11 to prove this to you. The Bible says, and look, this is a huge, this is the thing right here that separates us from the Protestants. The, and this is why, this is why I've said many times that I believe that the Reformation that everyone loves so much, look, we are not Protestants. We are not protesting the Catholic Church, the Baptist, the Christian, whatever he was called from Jesus' time to the independent Baptist now was never part of the Catholic Church. We're not protesting anything. We didn't come out of anything. We were always just following what the Bible says. 
all right, about salvation. That's why so many people had so much trouble when they added baptism to salvation. They added all these different works-based doctrines of salvation. That's why people like literally went to their death to just keep the gospel the gospel because of Romans 11.6. Look at Romans 11.6. So, and this is also why I think that many times Protestants are harder to get saved yeah. than Catholics. And I've had that experience so many times, I can't even remember. Because they're so wrapped around the axle with this works-grace mix that it is very hard to unwrap it. And what I'm talking, what I, the person I met on Thursday is a perfect example of that. Look at verse number 6. But this is what, I mean, if you hear people, if you hear people in your life, Protestants, whoever they are, say, you know, why do you have to be so exclusive? We all believe in Jesus. Why do you think that everybody else is going to hell and you know because we hold on to these things like eternal security we hold on to these things like you know it has to be full trust in Jesus and not some mix of you know the means of grace through works but it is because of Romans eleven six 6 and other verses like it where it says and if by grace then it is no more works otherwise grace is no more grace you see that that's the, that's the problem right there. Look, if the Bible said so, I would love it if we could get it together with all Protestant churches and it could be, you know, a mix of works and grace and, and just we could be all grace, whatever. But that's not what the Bible says. That's not what? That's not the truth. And if we go and pretend that's what the Bible says, what are we doing? We're just patting people on the back as they're on their way to hell. We're just saying, hey, great job, brother, and we're just walking them right to the edge of the cliff and watching them fall off. But we know what the truth is, because, look, is that complicated? Is that complicated? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. It's saying, if it's even a little bit works, there's no grace there. And we want people to have the grace. That's the gift. But if it be of works, and it is no more grace, otherwise work, is no more work. And you're like, well, okay, so that verse only tells me that it's either grace or works. I, I don't know which one it is, but look at the verse right before it. Even so, at this point in time, there's also a remnant according to the election of grace. So he's saying the answer is grace. And then he goes and he says, it can't be both. It's one or the other. And by, by the way, it's grace. This is why... You know, the Baptist has always drawn such a hard line in the sand and will add nothing to the gospel. But look, it, it, that's why, you know, when you're out sowing, you, you can't just say like, hey, just believe that Jesus died for you on the cross. No, you cannot say that. I mean, say that, but you must follow up that it is salvation is only trusting in that and letting go of everything else. And it's talking about, what's it talking about? It's talking about changing your mind completely about what you believed before. And instead, taking all that trust and putting it on Jesus, which is what? Is repentance. That's what it is. All right? So it makes, by the way, it's just, it's completely logical. It's completely logical. If you just think about it for just a little bit, you think about, you know, the means of grace and, you know, you have to go and you have to do the sacraments and all these different, however they dress up the works that you have to do. Or just even the fact that you could lose your salvation, that is you participating in your salvation. Because what causes you to lose your salvation? What causes you to lose your salvation is whatever that particular pastor makes up, first of all, but they're all works. It's all you not doing this or not doing this because there is no actual biblical list of things in the Bible that are the seven mortal sins or whatever, you know, some pastor or priest wants to make up. There's no biblical list of it. So it's just church dependent or, you know, whatever dependent on whatever that false prophet says. But the point is, it's all works that make you lose your, lose your salvation. So believing that you have to work along with you know, Jesus, to get your salvation is exactly the same. It's the equivalent of ble believing that you have to, okay, I just got to believe on Jesus, trust on Jesus, but then I got to work to keep it. It's the same thing. Right. It's just these tricky, it's these tricky, veiled, works-based salvation. I mean, that's why you'll get, you'll get soul winning with people, and you'll, ha you'll hear people, what do you have to do to get to heaven? 
And this was my experience again on Thursday. What do you have to do to get to heaven? Well, I'm just trying to follow the Bible, and I'm just trying to follow Jesus. I'm trying to go to church as much as I can, and I pray as much as I can, and do all the I, 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 I. Yeah. And then you go and show them, like, not of works. Of course it's not of works. It's just by faith. And, and then, like, again, like, it, it just, you can't unwrap them. That's why the, the Protestant movement is many times, I mean, I've called it the devil's plan B. I've called it the devil's plan B, because, like, the Catholic Church was just, like, completely off the rails. They're charging people to get, you know, they made up purgatory. They're charging to get your relatives out of purgatory, get your relatives out of hell. They're just charging all these different fees. You want to go sin? Just give us some money. You can sin. You can get some indulgences. I mean, just, it just got to the point of complete ridiculousness. And Satan's like, all right, more and more people aren't going for this because, like, the Bible's out there floating around. We're trying to burn them all, but we can't get them all. And the Bible's out there, and so we got the Reformation. It's by faith. You can get grace. It's, it's, it's by grace through faith, but you got to do some works to get the grace. It's, it's crazy, and it's completely confused people. All right, so look, repentance is talking about a complete... 100% change of mind from unbelief or whatever other belief to belief on Jesus, to trusting in Jesus. Go back to, um, go back to Luke chapter number 5. Let's go back to the great physician here. That's what Jesus was saying. So what Jesus was saying, he was saying only people that realize that they are sick can be helped. What's the sickness? Well, the sickness is sin. The sickness is the sin condition that people find them in. That's why we start out with, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're trying to tell people, you're sick. You got a problem here. We, then we go and we tell them what? We tell them that there's none righteous, no, not one, as we talked about this morning. And then what do we tell them? We tell them the wages for their sin. We tell them the consequences of their sickness. We tell them that, you know what, this sickness, this sickness is going to kill you. And it's going to kill you worse than anything on this earth can kill you. It's going to kill you eternally. It's like the worst thing you could possibly think of. That's why we spend so much time up front on sin, talking about the second death, talking about hell. This is, well, you know, an eternity in hell. This is why we go into that. I mean, it's a perfect analogy of Jesus the great physician or Jesus the physician here. Because think about it from the perspective. See... All people have the sickness, and this is what people didn't realize that Jesus was saying. He's like, no, 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 I'm only here for the sinners. All people have the sickness. It's just some people there didn't realize that they had the sickness. The Pharisees and the scribes, they didn't realize they were sick. That's why it's such a perfect analogy of a physician, because think about it. Think about uh, how much is a, you, you ever heard of that old guy that'll never go to the doctor? How much is a doctor going to be able to help somebody that will just never go to the doctor. What's going to happen? That person is just going to die of whatever happens to them. Maybe they live a long time. Maybe they, they don't, right? But look, how about this one? How about if a doctor, how about if a doctor, I'll even give that person a little bit of help. How about if a doctor comes to their door? How about if a physician, even that person that's stubborn and will just never go to the doctor, they're sick. They don't realize they're sick, and they're like, I'm not going to the doctor, I'm fine. But then a doctor comes to their door, and that doctor says to them, hey, what's wrong? What's wrong? And then you know what that person says? Just ask yourself how much the physician will be able to help this person. You know what that person says? She's like, what's wrong? And that person says, nothing. Nothing's wrong. They are terminally ill with the worst kind of sickness you could ever even think of. And they're like, nothing's wrong. How much is that doctor going to be able to help them? You think about it, the doctor says, okay, you know, that maybe the doctor even knows something's wrong. And the doctor says, where do, you know, where's the problem? Where's it hurt? Yeah, nowhere. Matter of fact, I'm cooking some ramen noodles. Can you, can you leave me alone right now? I'm kind of busy watching, you know, episode 18 of whatever stupid series is still running for the last 20 years. But this is why people and why we spend so much time explaining to people that they deserve to go to hell. Because they need to know that they're sick and they need to know what this sickness is going to do to them. Period.
But the people that are in what Jesus is saying is very simple. What the physician is saying here is that people that are like, I am well, cannot be saved. Turn to Luke chapter 18. They cannot be helped by the physician. Maybe that's a better way of putting it. They can't be helped by the physician. They first need to understand that I am not well. I am not good. All right, look at verse number 9 of Luke chapter number 18. Jesus says this. He says, He spake a parable unto, a certain, unto certain, which, look at this now. He spake this parable unto certain which trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a publican. You see, you see why Jesus was so upset at the Pharisees all the time? Because what were they trusting? They were trusting in themselves. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with, it, with himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican, tax collector. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much his eyes unto heaven and smote upon his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. There's a man that knows he's sick right there. There's a man that knows he's in trouble. There's someone that the physician can help right there. And it's another, you know, turn to Matthew chapter number 23. But Jesus, this is why Jesus was so upset with the Pharisees and the scribes. Because look, the outside, well, we'll get to that in a minute. But look at another example of this in Matthew 23 and verse number 13. Jesus says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye shut up the kingdom of heaven against men. For ye neither go in yourselves, neither suffer ye them to go that are entering to go in. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and you make pretense long prayer. Therefore, ye shall receive the greater damnation. He is saying the reason that Jesus was more upset and they were doing, he was saying literally they're going to receive a worse version of hell. They're going to go to a lower point in hell and suffer more for eternity because they are turning others away from the physician. It's not just themselves. It's, they're just not just a single person. They're, they're going to receive a greater damnation. Look, Jesus is saying these people are worse. And look, you have to understand that some people are worse than others because some sins are worse than others. The Bible is very clear about that. All sin, this all sin is equal doctrine is just, a, it's just another tool of changing the truth and it's people trying to justify evil to you. But look, some people are definitely worse than others and the outside, don't miss this, the outside is deceiving. If you think about the situation Jesus is in with the physician, you have these people. Look, I'm sure many in the public were even saying, why is he having dinner with these criminals? Why is he in the prison having dinner with those people? Shouldn't he be out amongst these pious people, these pious church leaders and all these things out here? Look, the outside is deceiving, folks. The people that looked better in this case were worse, were much worse. That's a lesson in itself, that the outside is deceiving. And, you know, once you get to know people, that's what really can kind of tell you who people are. But, I mean, you know, things to look for in people on the outside that are just red flags is pride. And even, like, you know, feigned humility are things to look for. All right? But just remember, in your life, in, in your outside life, in your, in your life in general, the outside is deceiving. All right? Many times, many times, people that are, that's why you see people that are holier than thou's, you know, they all, they, they look like they have everything perfect together and they're very critical and, you know, they're just like, so they've got everything squared away. Many times those people are an absolute train wreck. Yep. All right? So the outside is deceiving. I'm not saying go become a tax collector and a thief, but I'm saying that this is just a, a, a valuable lesson here from Jesus. All right? So Jesus is saying this is the reason that most people will not go to heaven is what he is explaining. Turn to Matthew chapter number 7. Remember the question in Luke chapter 13 that the disciples asked. They said, are there few that be saved? 
And they were asking Jesus, are most people going to go to heaven? I'll bring this up all the time too, out soul winning. I mean, sometimes I'll even ask people, what do you think most people are going to go to heaven? And the vast majority of people that you ask that question to will tell you that most people are going to go to heaven. All right, they have it exactly wrong. Look, I wish that was true, but it's not. All right, Luke chapter 13, verse 23, the question's asked, but in Matthew chapter 7, we get a detailed answer to that question, and the Bible says in verse number 13, Jesus says, enter ye in at the straight gate, meaning narrow, for wide is the gate, opposite of narrow, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, meaning the, the wide way, the, the, the way most people are going to go leads to hell, and there, many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it because you say why is that salvation is a free gift it's all through grace you have to do no work to get it why is it that very few people will receive it and the event the answer to that is is that you must acknowledge that you are sick that's why and you know what that takes some humility to do that you must acknowledge that you're sick before a physician before the great physician can help you all right the guy that won't ever go to the doctor is just gonna die when he dies but what is that guy you ever met that guy I've had uh, several of those those uh, men in my family just never go to the doctor you know what they are they're stubborn they're stuck in their ways and look th this can be good in cases in your life I'm not you know um, beaten down but like it, when it comes to salvation when it comes to repentance this is not a good thing to be stubborn it is not a good thing to be, this is why also that the older you get in general, the harder it is to get saved. Why? Because you become more and more stuck in your ways. And look, we've had 80, 85 year old people saved um, out soul winning. I'm not saying it's not possible, but it is much easier to get a 12 year old saved than it is an 80 year old saved. Like as a general rule. You'll find people that are like terminally ill of cancer. And you'll be like, this person for sure is going to be receptive. They've thought about death. They've thought about what's coming next. And many times, they are not, unfortunately. Because they must realize that you are spiritually sick and you need that spiritual physician. And look, it really comes down to pride. This is why we spend so much time on this up front, and I've said this many times, but when you're out soul winning, if you do a good job explaining sin, because everyone recognizes that they're a sinner, it's very, very rare that you will have somebody that doesn't say, that says that I'm perfect, right? And if they do, just, just don't waste too much time at that door. But the point is, we spend so much time on that, and if you do a good job explaining the sickness of sin, that people will tell you that they have. They're like, I have sin. If you tell them the sickness that that will bring to them through into eternity, you should have them for as long as you need them for the rest of the conversation, if you do a good job there. But the point is, how could you possibly be saved if you have nothing to be saved from? And this is why Jesus is the great physician. Why did God send his son to go through this horrible, horrible existence on this earth, this terrible, you know, this terrible death on the cross, and to just say that all, you know, we're all just going to go to heaven anyway. It makes no sense. The Bible is completely logical. And look, if you don't believe God's wrath is upon you or there's a punishment of hell, it's not possible for the physician to help you. All right, look, and it's also, this, this is the last thing I'll say on, on the, uh, the grace mixed with works thing. How insulting is that? Just realizing that God sent his son to go through this, to die for our sins, to take the punishment, to live an innocent life and take the punishment for us, die a horrible death. His soul went to hell for three days and three nights. And then he rises, rose again from the dead and goes through all that. And then we say, oh yeah, and I helped. I mean, it's totally understandable why God says, no, no, it has to be 100% my son. I commended my love towards you while you were yet sinners. And it, you, all you have to do is give him full credit for it because you did nothing but sin. It's incredibly insulting if you just think about it in the perspective of yourself. 
Well, you does some, I mean, you could never do something so wonderful as Jesus Christ, as God the Father through Jesus Christ did for us. You could never do that. But even if you could, if you saved somebody's life or you gave them some great priceless gift or you just, you know, took care of them for the rest of their life and then they came back and they said, oh yeah, you know, me and you really did that together. You would be incredibly insulted. That's why it has to be all Jesus. That's why repentance the true meaning of it is necessary for salvation. Turn to Philippians chapter number 4. We'll wrap it up here. So Jesus is the great physician. You have to realize that in order to be saved. But what about us? We're already saved. Does that still apply to us? Go to Philippians chapter number 4. Look at verse number 6. What if we live our Christian lives? What if we're saved? We've believed on Jesus. We've trusted on Jesus. And then we're like, you know what? We live the rest of our Christian life. God, God's never going to take away our salvation. And we just say, yeah, you know what? I'm good. I don't have any issues. I'm fine. Look at Philippians chapter number 4 and look at verse number 6. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 6. It says, be careful. Am I reading the right one? Be careful for nothing. Oh, yeah, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. God is telling us that, you know, he wants us to bring our problems to him. What if you don't acknowledge that you have any problems, though? What if you're this person that's like, oh, I know, I'm saved, and I'm reading the Bible, and I got everything figured out? You know what? They that are sick are not going to receive a physician. Meaning, you're going you're gonna to stunt your own Christian growth at some point because the first problem is admitting that you have a problem. The first, you know, the first step to solving any problem is admitting that you have one. And God tells us over and over in the Bible, ask and it shall be given unto you. We looked at that in Matthew 7, what, a week ago? Where, you know, it's this great analogy of this father towards his son. You know, I mean, ask. God wants us to ask. In James chapter 4, he says, you know, you ask, you know, you, you don't have anything because you don't ask for anything. And then when you do ask for things, you're asking for the wrong things. So God over and over in the Bible is saying you need to ask for things, ask for things. You know what he's saying? I'm a physician, I'll help you, but you've got to understand that you've got a problem. You've got to come to me and ask. Look, I mean, that was such a great analogy in Matthew 7, and it was explained in a sermon a week ago, where God wants us to come to him like a father wants his children to come to him. Look, that hit home for me because I have, I mean, I'm getting to the point where I have adult children. I have adult children. And a lot of people think, well, when your children get older, older, they're just gone and that's it. They're just out of the house and I don't have to worry about them at all. But guess what? Even, you know, the child that I have that, it's out, that is out of the house, that's got his own family, that is, you know, married and is going to have a child here soon, I'm still invested in, in that child. I still, I mean, I would still... Like, I still care. I'm still invested. Guess what? I'm still on that team. And if there was a problem with one of my adult children, you bet I would want to know about it. Why? Because I would still want to help. That's why. I, I'm, that's never, that's never going to go away with me. If one of my adult children is 35 years old and they get in some sort of trouble, there's never going to be a time when, but guess what? If they're in some kind of trouble, and they're living on their own, and they're not in my home anymore, and they never say anything to me. How would I know? How could I help? Maybe they were just so proud that they, would just, they never wanted to bring up any problems. But that's, isn't that what we do? We get so proud that we never want to come to the Lord with the things that we're struggling with. We never want to set up a prayer time to where we can just go to God, and maybe, maybe we've just... We backstabbed God so much in our daily life that we're embarrassed to come to him. But you know why God says as a father to a child that he wants us to come to him and ask? Because he actually wants to have a relationship with us. What kind of father would not want to have a relationship with their children? I mean, it's, but if we don't realize that we have problems and we've turned our back on the physician... There's, there's not going to be any help there. That's why God's saying, ask, ask, ask. He wants a relationship there. He wants a relationship. He wants there to be a close relationship. I hope when my kids are in their 40s that I still have a close relationship with them like I do today. 
I'm always going to be on that team. And God, this great, Jesus Christ, the great physician, is always going to be on our team. And that's why he's literally begging us. Just imagine that for a second. Literally, after he did everything for us to give us salvation that we did not deserve, he's begging us to have a relationship with him. It's kind of sad that that's what's necessary. But we need to have that. Jesus is the great physician. Not only did he save us and we have everlasting life, but we have access to this physician every day, every minute of our lives. But in order to be healed, we must understand this. It never stops. It's not like saved you, see you later. See you in heaven. And we just need to realize that. Jesus is the great physician before and after salvation. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.